Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, I hope you guys had a good fall break. I know I did. Uh, we graded your exams, so that was good. Um, quick announcement before starting. So, we graded your exams. Uh, I'll be handing them out at the end of today's uh, class. Uh, someone, at least one person scored 100. Uh, the average is generally I'm happy. Um, we also graded homework too, and I think the grade should be posted later today. And because uh, we're starting the second half of the semester, let's start with the homework. So homework three will be available by the end of today. Um, and uh, you know, since uh, you guys have too much free time, there's also a project intermediate report that's due on the 29th. Um, uh, this shouldn't be news, but uh, just reminding you. Um, and uh, the intermediate report, uh, there's some information about what is expected in the intermediate report, but just briefly, um, you should basically say, it should be, it's, it's a document no more than two pages long that should say what you've been doing for your project. Um, and it can't just be, we thought about it. Um, it should say what you've read, if you've read anything, and what your plan is in concrete steps for the rest of the semester. Uh, please take this at least mildly seriously because uh, it's a checkpoint that lets both of us know how progress is going and you know make corrections if necessary. Any questions? So you'll get your exams back at the end of the class and uh, let's continue where we left off. Uh, just to remind you, the big picture, and I'm sure uh, you guys are already familiar with this. Um, oh, and uh, another announcement, there are quite a few interesting talks coming up in the department through this week. So do check it out. In fact, there's the uh, CS department, the School of Computing Distinguished Lecture on Friday. That's about uh, injecting uncertainty into programming languages. And it's kind of an interesting uh, side point when we think of it from a machine learning point of view. So. Uh, do show up and uh, welcome the visitor. So, where are we? Um, this stuff is everything that we did uh, before the break. Um, we've been, you know, looking at voice learning quite a bit, and we looked at a few different ways of different general concepts that apply across machine learning. Um, in particular, the idea of using features, uh, representing instances as features. Uh, we looked at the curve of dimensionality, um, overfitting, and we studied the mistake-bound model of learning. And also we called it, uh, it, it, more broadly, we looked at online learning. And we looked at a few learning algorithms that uh, are in this space. Uh, just to remind you, uh, we are now in this space of batch learning. And um, to pick up where we left off, in online learning, we made no assumptions about the distribution of the examples. In fact, in fact, we uh, all the results that we proved were in the setting that the examples are in the worst possible sequence uh, as far as the learner is concerned. In batch learning, we make one assumption. We assume that examples are drawn from an unknown distribution. We don't care what it is, but it's fixed. So there's a little bit more information to this. Somewhat, uh, uh, there's another assumption on top of uh, this unknown distribution, which is it's fixed. Meaning, the examples that we get during training and the examples that eventually this classifier will be tested on are drawn from the same underlying distribution. In online learning, learning was framed as a series of trials. So, uh, and you guys are probably very comfortable with this idea right now. Uh, the learning is an iterative process in online learning where the learner gets an example, <coughs> makes a prediction, and probably a correction. In batch learning, all we assume is that the, the learner gets a block of examples, a batch of examples that are drawn independently and identically distributed. And uh, that's it. In online learning, or in the mistake bond uh, version of online learning, the key question was to get a bound on the number of mistakes this learner is going to make. In the batch learning setting, our goal is to find a hypothesis 
that has a low probability of making an error in the future. So we've seen all this. Questions? Okay. Uh, there are no questions. Let's move on. And I'm going to continue by actually redoing a bit of the proof that uh, we saw in the last lecture before the exam. Um, so that just to give some sense of continuity. So, learning theory, we are still in the lecture of uh, computational learning theory. And one way of thinking of learning theory is uh, it's asking the question what are, in some sense, the laws of nature when it comes to learning? And one, probably the most dominant theory in this uh, space is called prob is the PAC model of learning, also called, the well, PAC stands for probably approximately correct learning. So let's uh, explore this idea a bit. And before actually getting into a formal definition of PAC learning, I'm going to show you what PAC learning is by analyzing an example. And in fact, uh, we are going to analyze this example of uh, learning conjunctions. Uh, monotone conjunctions. Uh, okay, what I'll, the plan is, we'll look at an algorithm. Actually, it's a trivial algorithm, really simple algorithm, and uh, analyze it and I did, and basically ask, answer the question: How many examples do we need before we can be sure that we are doing okay? And a generalization of this style of analysis gives us PAC learning, and in fact, PAC is actually a formal definition of what learnability means, and we'll see that. And uh, I'll end the section with uh, something called Occam's Razor. Occam's Razor is an old, old idea in philosophy, pretty much independently developed roughly once at least every century, uh, named after, for some reason, Occam. And it turns out with this model of pack learning, we can actually prove a mathematical version of Occam's Razor. So let's get started. Uh, any questions about the roadmap? Uh, let's uh, get into this problem of learning conjunctions. We've seen this data before. We have eight or nine examples here, and there is this true function. And just to uh, point out, these examples are hundred-dimensional feature vectors and a label. The label is obtained by applying this function f to this feature vector, and the function f is hidden. <coughs> I mean, once the data is generated, nobody gets to see the function anymore, except for, you know, you and me. And I'm going to define the following simple learning algorithm. We'll call it elimination. Step one, get rid of all the negative examples, because at least in this algorithm, we are not going to use them. Step two, we will look at all the, so we are only left with positive examples. We will use all the features that have applied, that are common to all positive examples. So I've validated them in blue here. So x1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and x100. So basically what we're saying is the output is 1 if x1 and x2 and x3 and x4 and x5 and x100 are present. Otherwise the output is 0. So that gives us this function h. Uh, the, just as a side note, the reason this algorithm is called elimination is because uh, Effectively positive examples eliminate irrelevant features. So every positive, every feature that has a value 0 in a positive example gets thrown out. And whatever is left behind, we just put an and uh, between them and then we call that out. Does this algorithm make sense? So the first thing to, in proving anything, okay, first before getting into uh, any proof, I want you to notice, and this is important, that the true function did not have x1, whereas the learned function has x1. And we've seen this before, so I'm not going to stress this point, but this is important because when we start asking questions of how good is this learned function, effectively what we are asking is how much can this f x1 affect us in the future? What is the probability that there will be an example where x1 makes a difference? And really that is what we want to bound. But uh, before getting into that, uh, I want you to convince yourself that this function h is consistent with all the training examples. By consistent, I mean it will label all the positive examples as 
positive and all the negative examples as negative. Positive examples are easy because we just built it using positive. But we didn't use any of the negatives to build this function and yet it will be consistent. Why? Why should this procedure produce a function that labels this example correctly? I can wait. Because the function contains all the relevant features? Yes. And in particular, every negative example contains at least one missing relevant feature because that's why it's negative. This example is negative because x3 is 0. So every negative example, so what that means effectively is this process of elimination produces a function that, that contains a set of features, it's a conjunction of features, and those features are a strict superset of the actual set of relevant features. And that's why we make uh, no mistakes on negatives. Negatives either, in fact. There's a stronger claim to be made. This is just with respect to the training data. The stronger claim that can be made is even on future examples, this function h will never make any mistakes on negative examples. On examples that were truly negative. Why? Because at least one of those relevant features would be off, which is which means that both functions would agree. Exactly. If because the example was negative, at least one of the relevant features must have been missing. Because otherwise the example would have been labeled positive. Our true function has all the negative all the relevant features in it. So even, even if one of them is missing, the true function will label it as negative. More uh, to put it differently, there will be a mistake if there is some literal z. In our case, z is, uh, I'll use z to, whenever I say z, think x1. x1 is this additional thing that showed up. There is some literal, in this case x1, which is present in h, but not in f. And that is the only kind of literal that can cause h to make a mistake. Here's an example that makes forces h to make a mistake. When x1 is 0 and 2, 3, 4, 5 and 100 are 1, f will still predict it as positive. Right? Because 2, 3, 4, 5 and 100 are available. h will predict it as negative. This is the only kind of mistake that h can make. The opposite can never happen because, uh, as you said, um, H contains a superset of the variables. Um, another way of thinking about it, uh, I mean, I prefer thinking of it this way. This blue circle represents all the set of points that F will label as positive. The red circle is a strict superset. By adding another element to the conjunction, you reduce the set of things that you label as positive. So, just to repeat the claim, any hypothesis that's consistent with the training set that has been produced by the elimination algorithm will never make mistakes on negative examples. Okay? Yes. So you could, I mean, you're probably not supposed to, but essentially you could correct it in the testing if you um, had a positive example and predicted <laughs> negative and then Aha. you know. That assumes, okay, that's a good question in fact. That assumes that somebody gives you labels for test examples. Right. We don't have labels for test examples. Okay. Test examples are just future points that we are going to just label. But we never have the ground truth for future examples. Or at least in, uh, you know, in practice we never have the ground truth. So for example, if you are going to build a classifier that labels a tweet as spam or not, who's going to tell you whether it's spam or not? Okay, so the easy part here is defining the algorithm. The more involved thing here is to show that this algorithm is actually a meaningful one. Because anyone can write down an algorithm, but without being a, without a proof, the algorithm is just a heuristic. So, in this case, the proof takes the form of a theorem. 
And we've seen this theorem before, but I'm going to spend some time reading this again. <coughs> Suppose we're learning a conjunction, both the two functions are conjunction, and we use the elimination algorithm. This theorem says that if there are, if your training size, the number of training examples you have, in this case m, is more than a certain number. Let's ignore what that number is. It's more than a certain number, then if you have seen enough examples, then with high probability, with probability more than 1 minus delta, so delta is a small number, high probability your learned classifier will have a low error. Ignore the fact, ignore what the right hand side of that expression is. I want you to think, spend some time thinking about that statement. Basically this statement says, if there are enough examples, then the elimination algorithm will produce a classifier, a good classifier. Good because it will have low generalization error. The elimination algorithm will produce a good classifier with very high probability. Yes. Is this M the number of positive examples? No, M is the no, size of the training set. M is the size of the training set. Of positive and positive negative. Positive and negative, yes. And the reason that works is because we're assuming that it's of the same distribution that we'll have. Yes, in fact, we've proved that. We've proved the statement. And the key, distribu the key assumption that enables this proof to happen is the IID and fixed distribution. Other questions? Now let's look at the right hand side. I don't want you to get worried by it, but basically I just want to tell you that most of the statements that, uh, the theoretical statements about learning algorithms that you will see will look something like that. There will be an epsilon and a delta. Delta is a measure of confidence. One minus delta is actually, what is the probability that you will get a good classifier? One minus delta, if delta is small, then with high probability you will get a good classifier. So notice that if delta is small, if delta is small, this term becomes large. Which means, if you want high confidence of getting a good classifier, then you need a lot of examples. Another thing here is epsilon. If epsilon is small, meaning you want a really, 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 really good classifier, this term becomes large, <laughs> which means you need more examples. So if you need very high confidence of getting a good classifier, you need a lot of training examples. If you need a very, very good classifier, you need a lot of training examples. And here is the dimensionality, and it shows up because, you know, that's how the math works. But uh, the one way to think about it is if the dimensionality increases, you need more examples. Questions about this general form of stick? Okay, so let's go ahead and prove this statement. And it's going to take about 15 minutes to prove this, but I'm going to go a little bit slow on this. Uh, the next proof that we'll do, I'll just rush through. So, to prove this, and this is just kind of a pathological construction that we are going to use to make this proof work, I'm going to define this term Tz as a probability that in some example in the future, that example has a label plus, but the feature z is missing. So z, think of z as x1. If in a future example, that example has a positive label, but x1 is missing, that's exactly where our classifier will make a mistake. Because we'll only make mistakes on positive examples. Just to remind you, we have f and h. And if you get an example like this, where x1 is missing in the true example, but the label is positive. So what we are asking is, what is the probability that this situation occurs with x1? We are just giving it a name. Because this is the kind of bad situation that we do not, we hope does not happen. Does it make sense? Questions? Okay, so we just to remind you, p of z is the effectively a measure of what is the error that little z can cause in a future example. 
And another thing that you should remember is the idea, the definition of the true error. Error, I call this error D of a hypothesis. This is not the uh, error on the training set, but this is the expected error this, is, this hypothesis will make on a future exam. And we can directly say the true error will be less than the sum of all these P of Z. Why? And the answer is also, uh, it's the, the answer is it's the union bound, but why? So let's think of an example. Let's, uh, let me give you an example. Suppose there are two such um, features that occur in the trains, that occur in the hypothesis H, but not in the true function. Like X1 here, let's say we have X1 and X20. The error in the hypothesis can be caused by X1 showing up. It can be caused by X20 showing up, or it can be caused by both of them showing up. Right? So, error of the hypothesis is probability of P of X1, P and plus P of X20, plus P of X1 uh, and X20, and minus some terms that basically say that we don't double count. This is basically the uh, law of total probabilities. And the union bound says, this error, this probability is, this probability of a set of events, what we care about is the probability that at least one of them happens. If even one of these things show up, then we've lost a point. The probability that at least one of them happens is less than the sum of the probability of each of them happening. That's the union bound. So what we can tell right away using this notation is that the error, the true error of this hypothesis has to be less than the sum of all PCs. Let's just keep that in mind and uh, see what we can do with that. Now, another bit of notation. Let's say that this a little, like little, little z, like x1, is bad if its probability of not showing up with a positive example is very high. Now, what that means is, why is this a bad little? Because suppose this little does not show up with any training example in the future then every time this happens, we are going to get hurt. Like if x1 keeps, you know, not showing up, we are going to get hurt only if x1 showed up with every training example and thus did not get eliminated. Right? So what we are asking is, how, how surprised would you be if this literal z, which was, which you expect not to show up, somehow showed up with every training example. So in other words, we are asking, how surprising is this training, this training set? How unrepresentative is this training set? And the intuition is, because we are assuming that this IID intuition, because we are assuming that the training examples are just sampled using the natural distribution, it should not be very surprising. It should not uh, have this, this situation should not happen very often where x1 shows up with every training example, but it has a very low probability of actually showing up. So, if there are no bad literals, then life is good, because the error of the, you know, the, the true error has, will be less than epsilon, because it's just less than the sum of the number of, uh, the, the total probability of these things. So, if no literal was bad, then life is good. Really, the problem is when there's some literal that's bad. Let's let's uh, look at what is the probability. Let's say what is let's say we have a little z. That's a bad little. Then we should ask what is the probability that one bad little was not eliminated by one training example. The probability that it gets eliminated by a training example is it does not show up with a positive uh, example. The probability that it survives that example is the prob one minus probability gets eliminated, which is 1 minus P of Z, which is 1 minus epsilon over N. Just to remind you, this is the kind of example that does not eliminate a bad literal, because X1 shows up. So we are asking, what is the probability that this happens? The 
probability that x1 does not get eliminated by a training example is 1 minus is less than 1 minus epsilon over n. <coughs> Questions? Ask me a question. Yes. This is the part where my brain was kind of like it was mush, but can you go walk through that again? The probability. The okay, let's take this particular example here. Okay. Okay? This the inside the red box is x1. And it so happens that in this example, x1 ha shows up and this example has a positive label. Now, if x1 was a bad literal, what we are asking, so, so think of the algorithm. What does the algorithm do? This is a positive example, which means this particular example does not eliminate x1. This e example eliminates x7 and x98, but not x1. Right? Now we are asking, what is the probability that the elimination algorithm does not eliminate x1? That is simply the probability that x1 shows up with a positive example. But what is the probability that x1 shows up with a positive example? It's 1 minus the probability x1 does not show up with a positive example. And we have made an assumption, but that's, simp that's literally the definition of P of Z. P of Z is the probability that the feature does not show up with a positive example. So, the probability that Z survives this example is 1 minus the probability that Z is eliminated, which is 1 minus probability that Z does not show up, which is less than 1 minus P of Z, which by assumption on top is less than 1 minus epsilon over n. And this is honestly the trickiest part of this whole proof. The rest of it is repeated application of the union bound and just some algebra. So if you get this, the rest of the proof is actually literally just algebra. So questions? And I can assure you, if you have a question, at least another 40 of you have the same question with high probability. Yes? So a few slides back when you were explaining how we got the error, could you explain the math that, uh, that the, yeah. This one? Yes. Could you explain the, that one more time? The? Yeah, like I, I sort of understand the concept of the union bound on its own, mm -hmm. but I don't really understand like, like H is the, is a, a hypothesis, right? Mm -hmm. Like for a given hypothesis and like, so you're saying essentially that you're going through all of the possible hypotheses in your system. No, no, we have a single hypothesis. We are asking what is the error of this particular hypothesis. That hypothesis is simply comprised of a bunch of literals. So each literal in that hypothesis could contribute to the error. Independently or in conjunction with each other. And we have assumed that P of Z is effectively the probability that this literal is contributes to this. But we don't want to you know, account for all those combinations and all those things. So we're just going to have a loose upper bound using this, uh, using just by treating each literal as an independent thing. So this is a bound on the error for one given hypothesis? Yes. Okay. Yes. So we don't talk about the bounds in a more, like for all of the hypotheses? We'll get there. Okay. In fact, that is another application of the union bound over the sets of hypotheses. That's, that's basically step three of the proof. So first we are going to ask what is the error of, we're going to define what is the error of a hypothesis. And then we'll see what's the error of, what's the probability that this particular literal z, in this case x1, does not get eliminated by one example. This is the first uh, set up here, first uh, step in the proof. And if People are clear, we can go ahead. I can wait. So can I just walk through my reasoning? Excellent. So you're saying we choose an example at random, and we're asking what is the chance that the disease survives that one example, 
-hmm. And then that's one minus the probability that it doesn't survive that exception. Yes. And the little p of z is more general. No, no. You, little p of the jump from here to here mm -hmm. happens because of uh, this particular algorithm defines survival in a peculiar way. The literal survives that example only if the example is positive mm -hmm. and, sorry, elimination in this case. The literal is eliminated only if the example is positive and the value of that feature is zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And P of Z is exactly the probability of that opposite condition happening. That makes sense? Yeah. So the the first probability on the right side, the probability z is eliminated by one example. That event is contained in the event that it's eliminated by any example, right? That we that's basically step two. Okay. Yes. That's a very good question. Yes. Uh -huh. Question. So, You're from, my TA. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so from first line to second line, is that a less than or equal to? That's a less than because uh, let's see. Oh, because we can't be sure that it's just because of that. Hold on. It, the probability that z is eliminated by an example is, okay, I have to think about it. It might be equal, but this inequality is valid. Yeah, the, the last one is less than yeah, 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 I have to think about that. There may be, it may be less than or less than equal. I, I, I'll, if, I'll think about it, and if it changes, I'll fix it and let you guys know. Okay, at this point, the rest of this proof is fairly, is less convoluted. So, what we know is, question? Okay. What we know is that the probability that a bad literal, some bad literal z, is not eliminated by one example is less than 1 minus epsilon over n. Remember that n is the dimensionality here. So, we have, first before that, we have m training examples. The probability that it's not eliminated by one example is 1 over n, 1, one minus uh, epsilon. The probability that it's not eliminated by m training examples, these are all independent events. This is where the IID comes in. Every training example is independent. So if it survives one example, then it's 1 minus 1 over epsilon over n. If it survives 2, it's that quantity squared. If it survives m, it has to be less than that quantity power n. This is for one feature. <coughs> At most, there can be n bad literals because there can be at most n features. So the probability that some uh, feature survives, any one, because even if one survives, we might be in trouble. So the probability that hold on. Apparently I have to sign in to one note, so let me see if what this means. Oh well. So the probability that any feature survives, again this is another application of the union bond. There are n features, so we add this quantity of n times. So that's just n times this thing. So the probability that any feature survives the entire training set and is still a bad feature has to be less than that quantity. n times 1 minus epsilon power n. n. What we want, and this is exactly the situation that we do not want to have. So in fact, what we want is that we want this probability to be very small. How do we make this small? We can demand that this entire thing, that right hand side, is less than some tiny delta. If the, in the, left, if the right hand thing is less than delta, then the probability that some bad literal survives has to be less than delta. And if delta is small, then we are in good shape. Questions? Questions about the previous talking.
Okay, we have 30 seconds have passed, so let's move on. So, what we want is to bound the quantity that we have, uh, n times blah blah blah, by some delta, and force delta to be small so that our life is good. At this point, uh, I, I, the next thing that we need to do is to simplify this thing and make it look like the final expression that I have presented. To, do, to use that, we are going to use one more inequality. Uh, it's simply this, uh, I don't know if the, this is visible at the end, it's, I'm going to rate it out. We know that 1 minus x is less than e power minus x. So, we can use that information to simplify this uh, quantity. So, we know that 1 minus x is less than e power minus x. In other words, 1 minus epsilon over n is less than e power minus epsilon over n. That quantity power m is less than this n. Right? So let's multiply that by n and we get So, we know this to be true. n times 1 minus uh, blah blah blah. And what I have here is simply the quantity that we care about. And we know that that's less than e, n times e power m epsilon over n. Now, if I demand that the right hand side is less than delta, then automatically the left hand side has to be less than delta. So, we can, this is a much nicer expression, so we can simplify this instead. So, remember that we are making these very crude uh, bounds here. This is actually a very, very rough bound, but it's still, uh, it still works. So, uh, is this clear? And we'll use this inequality quite a few times. 1 minus x is less than e power minus x. It's um, just a convenient thing to use. And uh, I'm not going to bother to prove it. You should try to prove it yourself. Okay, so we know, so all we want is to require that n times e power minus m epsilon over n is less than delta. And basically that's the end of the proof. You take log and just rearrange things and you get what we had. And I'm not going to the re do the rearrangement, but I can assure you that this is what happens. So basically that gives our theorem. So what this tells us, what this tells us is to guarantee that our classifier, the will be correct fewer than epsilon fraction of times. Sorry, to guarantee that the classifier that we will find a good classifier with high probability and good being defined as a classifier that has low error. All we need is to find a training set that is larger than this quantity. And notice that this quantity is polynomial in n, it's polynomial in 1 over delta, and in 1 over epsilon. And this characterization becomes important in a little bit. Another way of thinking about it is, uh, if you have this size of training set, so M, uh, you know, if you have a certain number of training examples with a certain dimensionality and you can find epsilon and delta such that this property holds, then you can make the following statement. You can say that with probability 1 minus delta, the true error, no, note that this is all about future examples, the true error will be less than epsilon. We managed to prove a theorem without any assumptions about or without any knowledge of the future examples except just one assumption, that the future looks like the past. So effectively the only piece of information we've used here is that the future examples 
will be or that the training examples are a representative set of what you will be tested on. So the way to use this is Uh, you know, one way to use this is to think of epsilon as accuracy and delta as uh, 1 minus reliability. So if you want a 90% accurate classifier and you want to get that classifier with a guarantee of that you want a 90% guarantee that you will find such a classifier. For 100 dimension example, you can just plug these numbers in, you need like 7000 training examples. If you have lower dimensionality but with the same guarantees, you can get away with few, fewer number of training examples. You, but for the lower uh, dimensionality, if you want a very high confidence that you got a good enough classifier, then you need a little bit more. So it's kind of okay, it makes sense. I mean, if you want high guarantee, high confidence in your classifier, you need lots of examples. If you need a very good classifier, you need lots of examples. Yes? So is it high confidence such that you will get the accuracy that you want? Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. The way to read this statement is with high probability, the probability 1 minus delta, we'll have a classifier whose error is less than epsilon. Yes? This question may have been, should have been asked a little farther back. I'm just thinking about getting that number of samples. I remember last time in homework number two, we were asked to randomly get, oh, to get the, we had 10 epochs of the same data set. Yes. Do those example, training examples need to be unique or could they be potential reach to each other? So these training examples are random draws from the underlying distribution. If you do 10 epochs, you are effectively changing the underlying distribution. You may be. So you may be tweaking the underlying distribution. So think of the whole thing as a single black box. The, tra the learning algorithm gets a set of examples. The algorithm can do whatever it wants inside. Okay. But we are sitting outside the learning algorithm. Or in this case, we had to peek into the learning algorithm because we, to derive this, we use the definition of elimination. The next thing that we are going to do with Occam's razor does not care about what happens inside the box. It's, it's, it's an, in fact, effectively, this kind of a statement is an information theoretic statement. How much information is there in the training set? And you can do whatever you want inside. So what we have here, if there are no other questions, I'm going to move along. What we have here is a guarantee that your classifier is approximately correct. But it's not guaranteed to be approximately correct, it's probably approximately correct. So that's the real, I didn't make it up, it's the legend name. So what we have here is a pack guarantee, probably approximately correctness guarantee question. So, out of curiosity, let's say that you have a data set and you, you're, you're, and you have the entire data set available to you. Sure. So, you're not going to, you're, you're going to pick the largest number possible because larger is better in yes. some sense. Yes. Um, I, I would assume that you can use this formula basically to describe that, the probability that you're, or, you know, this. You can, uh, you, if you have, a, if you're given a training set and you know the dimensionality, then you can basically tweak epsilon and delta. You can say, what's the probability that this classifier trained on this data set will be good enough? So you can, you know, move the terms around, and you can say that if you move epsilon around on that side and bring m down, you say error will be greater than so much. Okay. Do these ideas tie to the ideas of type one, type two error? Not directly. It's not. In fact, this is. You can think of it as related, but it's not directly uh, connected. No. So this is so. Remember that for deriving this statement, this is just an example of the kind of packed uh, proof that happens. For deriving this, what we assume a particular hypothesis class and a particular learning algorithm. So next I'm going to define PAC and then talk about Occam's Razor where we'll derive a very, very similar statement independent of the hypothesis class and independent of the learning algorithm. And that will be the version of the PAC, the PAC 
uh, algorithm that the, the sorry the pack guarantee that applies to arbitrary uh, functions and learning algorithms. In fact, it the actual Occam's razor does not even care about what the learning algorithm is. I can see you're hungry for more, so let's move along. Uh, so this is a pack guarantee. So let's formally define pack. And before that, I want to just list out every symbol that we saw before because the pack guarantee is going to be basically a function of all these things. So just to remind you, we're training classifiers. Classifiers are functions that take instances from the instance space X to a label space Y. And we are only limiting ourselves to the output space being binary. We are assuming that our instances are drawn from a probability distribution over X. It's fixed but unknown. Another unknown in this world is uh, the target function. There is a function f that's fixed and uh, it's a member of this class of functions called the concept class. Our learning algorithm searches over another set called the hypothesis class. And in order to search for a good hypothesis, our learning algorithm has is provided a training set, S, which consists of M examples. These M examples are drawn, in are drawn by independently sampling the uh, instance space. There are two errors of interest. There's an error on the training set. For a given hypothesis, I can compute the error of that hypothesis on the training set. By the way, I use the word hypothesis and the word classifier interchangeably. So, for any classifier, I can ask how many mistakes does this classifier make on the training set, which is simply the fraction of mis number of mistakes it makes divided by the size of the training set. This is called the empirical error. And there's also the true error of a classifier, which is the expected error that this classifier makes on a random example chosen from the instance space. And when I say chosen randomly, I mean chosen according to this distribution D. Any questions about just the term notation? And the kind of questions that we care about at least addressing or thinking about are, can we say something about the true error in terms of the empirical error? Because remember, we only have, our only connection to the true function is through this training set. So we can only measure things on the training set. We have no other interaction with the true function. So, can we say something about the training error and the true error, connecting these two things? And we are not going to answer that question immediately, we will get there in a bit. The second question, which is actually probably more important and uh, something that really lies at the heart of learning theory is, is this class of functions learnable? Can there ever be, I don't know what training algorithm, but can there be some training algorithm learning algorithm that can learn this class of functions. Is it possible to learn this class of functions using a different hypothesis space where H is not necessarily C? Can I learn a good enough approximation of a function that belongs to C using another function that belongs to H? So for example, the true function might have come from a set of all volumes. Can I learn a good enough approximation of it using only conjunctions, where the number of mistakes it makes is not too many? And the final thing, the style of uh, guarantee that we just saw, how many examples are needed? Is the number of examples needed a reasonable one for getting any guarantee? So these are the kinds of questions that we seek to answer, and through maybe this lecture and maybe the, and all of uh, at least the next two lectures, we'll see if we can answer these questions, at least in certain limited uh, settings. So, at the heart of this theory, we have to think about what does it mean to learn? We really, we can't hope to learn a concept exactly. There's no hope. Because, typically, if you are given a, a training set, there can be multiple functions that are consistent with it. So, how do you know which one to pick? Or if you are given a training set, 
it's only it's guaranteed to be finite and future examples can have arbitrarily different labels so in an adversarial setting learning is impossible so we can't really expect learning to happen i mean if you have a magic function in your mind and you're going to transmit it to me through a finite set of examples in general there's no hope that i will have the same function as you have so we have to agree in order to come up with any theory we have to agree that these kinds of adversarial situations don't happen too often or in other words we have to agree that the training set is actually a good representation of the entire set of examples this is the i uh, the uh, the assumption that we made that the train and test distributions are the same in fact we can't even learn we can't even expect to learn a close approximation to the target function in general there's no hope for that why because you know sometimes the training set will not be representative and we are hoping that this is a very rare thing in fact the only expectation that we could possibly have is that a learner a learning algorithm if it's good enough will with high probability learn a close approximation it can fail sometimes and sometimes it can learn a bad function but with high probability you'll get a good enough function so this intuition gives us the definition of probably approximately correct learning by the way this definition was uh, uh, from a paper by Leslie Valiant and it's at least 30 years old now it was from a paper in 1984 and Valiant got his Turing award Oh, I think in 2011 or 10 or something, and one of the things that was part of the citation for his award was this development of this theory of learning. So it's actually a big foundational piece of computer science. So in back learning, what we assume is that we are given these two small numbers, epsilon and delta. Both of them are between zero and one. And I don't care what the learning algorithm is, but it's a concept is packed learnable if there is some learning algorithm i don't know which one there's some learning algorithm that produces a function with high probability that uh, the uh, a function that's correct or we have no for correctness a function that is almost correct has an error less than epsilon and the way we make this work is this consistent distribution assumption so before getting into the formal definition is this intuition any questions about this intuition okay so let's see a definition and this is going to fill up the entire slide so let's Maybe go slow. We have a concept class C, and uh, this concept class operates over instances in a space X, and these instances are n-dimensional. There's some learning algorithm L, and there's a hypothesis space. The learning algorithm is uh, it produces functions from a hypothesis space H. Then this concept class so. Pack learnability is a property of a concept class. C is said to be pack learnable by this learning algorithm use, that uses H. If it doesn't matter which function is the true function in the concept class, it doesn't matter what the distribution over the training examples is. For a fixed epsilon and delta, given some m training examples that are sampled IID. The algorithm produces a, a fixed hypothesis with the probability one minus delta that has an error less than epsilon. But that's not all. So up to here, we have seen things. That's not all. We demand that this m cannot be more than polynomial in one minus one over epsilon, one over delta, n, and the size of the hypothesis. This is just a definition, but it's really a lot of stuff going on. Just to remind you, the true error is the probability that 
the uh, true function and the hypothesized function disagree. So instead of me talking, I'm going to let you read this for a bit and then ask me questions. <laughs> Ask me a question. Yes. I don't understand what that last line means. Where n is polynomial and one over epsilon. Like, what would be a counterexample to that? So m is ex so m is a number of examples, right? So a, a counterexample could be if m is exponential in the size of h, or if m is exponential in the dimensionality. So a natural complexity measure of a problem is the dimensionality and the size of the hypothesis space, right? So if the num if the size of the hypothesis space is if and effectively what we're asking is how many examples do you need to learn this uh, this concept class? And if the number of examples you need is exponential, then you're never going to get those many examples because as n increases, it gets really large. Very quickly. So a counterexample, the standard counterexample, and we'll see that as soon as we see Occam's razor. The standard counterexample is a set of all Boolean functions. The size of the hypothesis space is 2 power, 2 power n. And uh, typically these things fail, the, the standard counterexample every, for all of this is um, that set. The one that we saw just now is not a counterexample because I don't expect you to remember that equation, but it was a function of n log n. m was greater than n times log n plus 1 log 1 over delta something. It was a function of n log n, which is polynomial. On the other hand, if m was greater than 2 power n, then there is no hope for learning. Or at least according to this definition. So it would be like less than some polynomial like n squared or something, or some, or some function that increases less, more slowly than polynomials? No, less slowly than exponential. So that's basically what polynomial means. It's yes. not exponential. It's not exponential. It can be arbitrarily large polynomial. Remember that you know in the world of complexity, you know, computational complexity, n power a million is still a polynomial. It's an embarrassing polynomial, but it's still a polynomial. So this is back learning. Meaning this is the def what we have here is a definition for whether a concept class is pack learnable or not. But notice that this says nothing about an algorithm. Because it's possible that this algorithm, this class may be pack learnable, but the algorithm that actually operates on the data might need an exponential time. This has got nothing to do with time complexity. So a little bit of additional, another condition that we can add on top of this is the concept class is efficiently back learnable if L can produce a hypothesis in a polynomial time. It takes only a polynomial amount of time to produce a hypothesis that satisfies all these problems. So the first condition is has got nothing to do with uh, computational complexity. It has to do with how many examples are needed to get a good enough function. The second one says how many examples are needed to get a good enough function in a reasonable amount of time? So this introduces two notions of difficulty. We have two limitations. One thing is called sample complexity. And this is a phrase that you will see a lot. 
sample complexity is an information theoretic constraint that asks, are there enough examples in your sample that can let uh, any, some learning algorithm pick out a good enough hypothesis? And this is related to the point that someone else raised before, is there enough information in your training set? Is the training set large enough to encode all the information that's needed? That's sample complexity. Typically, when I say sample complexity, think number of training examples. The second com uh, limitation is time complexity. How much, how, how long will this learning algorithm run for? It's not enough if you have a low sample complexity because if it just so happens that even though there's a low sample complexity, that any learning, even the best learning algorithm will take an exponential amount of time, we are in trouble. So these are orthogonal points, they are independent and often uh, they correlate with each other but there are counter examples where some concept classes, classes can be learned from an information theoretic point of view but cannot be learned from the time point. Questions about sample complexity. I'm assuming that some of you, most of you have seen computational complexity before. Uh, the idea of sample complexity is not does not show up outside of uh, the machine learning universe. So, yes. Is there a difference between sample complexity and the number of samples? It's exactly that. It's exactly. the number of examples needed to satisfy this condition. So it's the same thing as that? Yes. <clears throat> so, for Another way of thinking about being, of a concept class being fact learnable is if the class is fact learnable, then it, every function, there must be some hypothesis that is really close to any function in the concept space. So in some sense, what we want is a concept space that contains the hypothesis space. Sorry, the other way around. So, if this is a set of functions that C that uh, might show up, if you are searching over a larger set, H, then there is some function in H which is very close to every function in C because H contains C. It's properly pack learnable if H is equal to C. It's just a name. I mean, I don't necessarily see what. There's nothing to. Uh, complicated about that. And notice that uh, this definition of pack learning is a worst case definition given the fixed distribution assumption. This uh, learning algorithm L must meet this accuracy criteria, meaning the accuracy should be less than epsilon, for every function in the concept class. It doesn't matter because it's possible that an adversary chooses the worst possible, the most unlearnable function from that concept class and yet this algorithm has to learn it. And it has to learn it for every distribution. Doesn't matter what the distribution of the examples is because we have no control over that. We don't have control at training time over the distribution of examples and the choice of this hidden function. So effectively the kind of guarantee that we need to provide is this guarantee holds for every distribution, for every possible uh, function. Questions? Yes? Is it reasonable to assume that the distribution doesn't change when you all examples? That's a good question. That's a deep question, actually. So let me repeat that. The question was, is it reasonable to assume that this distribution does not change? In other words, is that assumption that uh, of the fixed distribution a valid one. Can someone try to think of an answer before I make a suggestion? <coughs> or in fact, can you think of an example where that's an unreasonable assumption? Yes? I have a different question. Uh, so if I'm not wrong, we, it's also an assumption that we can escape because we also have the same distribution. Yes, yes, that's the same thing. The assumption is that future examples will come from the same distribution as your training set. Or alternatively, the assumption is there's only one distribution, every example at train and test is sampled from the same thing. Yes? This is a dumb answer, but I thought you could 
depends, right? Like you were doing like an algorithm to estimate like I don't know the time it takes for a letter to get to from point A to point B. What if there's some new form of transportation that comes out of this? Yes. So if this if the underlying instance space changes, the distribution probably changes. Another uh, one, uh, let me give you an example where it's valid. So if you have, say, um, it's actually not a, any example I can think of, I can quickly think of counter examples. So let me give you an example that's invalid. Um, in fact, this is a problem that's called domain adaptation or where this distribution changes. So the example is, um, there's a popular data set called uh, the 20 news groups data set where the goal is you're given, this was in the world of, uh, uh, what do you call them, news groups, where I don't know, most of you are too young to know what they are. Um, think of it as you're given a posting and it has to be posted in the right form. And this is a news group data set that was developed with, where there are 20 labels and you have to, given the posting, you have to find out which forum it should be posted in. And this was collected sometime in the 90s or something. And the politics forum, for example, talked about Bill Clinton. <laughs> Clinton at that time meant Bill. Now it's a different Clinton that's uh, in work. So typically, and Bush meant a different Bush. So the, if the underlying space of instances changes, we no longer have this guarantee that the distribution over examples is the same. It's possible that an article talking about Clinton now might talk about his philanthropic things. It, it's possible that an algorithm, uh, uh, an example talking about, anyway, you, you get my point. So if the underlying concepts change, the classifiers themselves may have to change. Question. Is it true that most instance, for most instance spaces uh, that, that are capable of changing over time, which I guess would be almost anything, uh, has some sort of time scale on it that you would be able to say that you have a high probability of learning it? <coughs> in that time scale and it wouldn't have a... So the thing is, even within a single time scale, it's possible that there might be multiple distributions, except that we're just not aware of it. Mm -hmm. If you sample, say, news groups postings in the United States, you might get a different distribution from, say, in a different country. Um, so this is... What that means really is there's another distribution that we're just unaware of and we're getting biased samples. And... Our hope is that that doesn't happen. All the learning guarantees that we have, most of the learning guarantees that exist are under the assumption that this distribution doesn't change. And there are explicit methods for trying to model the change sometimes. Yes. I can't think of a, you know, well, let me just say it. So, could you say, like, if the distribution changed, that would be equivalent to, you know, just your trainings that came from a larger distribution and you just happen to get like a more... That's one way of thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's that, that you're getting a, a biased sample. Yeah. Effectively. Yes. Are there any standard methods for trying to understand the distribution and trying to understand like the kind of things we're talking about here? Right. In fact, there are... Um, when we get to uh, the section on probabilistic models, we'll try to explicitly model, uh, at least we look at one algorithm that explicitly models the joint distribution of x, comma y. <laughs> and there we will try to compute the probability of the, uh, the instance space. Um, again, we are still limited by our training set, but we, there, are, uh, there are probabilistic models that let us try to at least compute that. Yes? So just one more point on that, so, on what I said a second ago. So does the assumption that the distribution is fixed, is that really necessary then? That you can always just assume, like, you know, you just have to get bad bias? No, so what we have, it's actually essential to make the proofs work. But more importantly, the notice that this is true. The It is true for any distribution. So this is called the distribution-free assumption. So it could be that larger distribution as well. Our hope is our training set is not sampled from some tiny section of the distribution. Yes? Do you call it a worst case definition because uh, my accuracy can differ 
distribution? Sure, I can give you a classifier where the distribution. Um, I, I, let me give you a training set. <laughs> okay. uh, let's say this is. Um, ah, let's say we are trying to build a spam detector, and your training set consists of hundred emails. Every single one of them is not spam. And you know you and at test time I only test you on spam. So your classifier is going to be lost. I created this distribution. So just to uh, of course here I change the here I change the train test distribution, but let's say I create an adversarial distribution which is strongly which strongly biases your classifier towards a certain label. So that you do not get enough statistics for that label. At test time, you will make mistakes on those labels. So does the order of my test we don't, also my no, we, this definition here, the error, true error is just the probability that you will make a mistake. It is completely independent of the order. Right, there are 7 minutes left. And I'm wondering. So let me just get started with Occam's Razor and get you through the proof again in the next class. So I've defined the PAC model of learning. It's just a definition. I mean, it's doesn't. I mean, our definition is only so good as what it lets us build. So it's just a definition. And the, one of the cool things about this definition is it gives a mathematical formalism for something that is very well known. Uh, it's called the Occam's Razor. It's named after this guy called William uh, from Occam. Turns out Occam is a place in England, it's still there. Uh, and in general, the idea is if you have two explanations that agree with the data, pick the simpler one. And there's a Latin version of it that you can try to pronounce. And it's not a new, I mean, it's not, on one hand, it's a pretty strong. Uh, bias towards picking explanations, but this has been independently developed pretty much by every philosopher works his or her thought. And what we are going to do is to show that Occam's razor just jumps out of this definition of pack learning. So, in order to formalize this claim, in order to formalize Occam's razor, I am going to make a claim. I don't care what the learning algorithms. I don't care what the concept spaces. I don't care what any of these things are. The probability that there's some hypothesis that is consistent with, the, with every single training example, and yet has an error more than epsilon, has to be less than this quantity here. And I can prove this very quickly. So let me get through the proof. And this is kind of cool. Notice that I'm making no assumptions here. I mean, I'm, I'm really, this, except for the distribution-free assumption. So the probability that this hypothesis, this hypothesis makes very large error has to be less than h times one minus epsilon for it. Let's say uh, h is one such bad hypothesis that has such a high error. The probability that it's consistent with the probability that it's makes a mistake is basically like asking the probability that it's inconsistent with an example. And we assume that the probability that it's inconsistent is more than epsilon. So the probability that this function is consistent with one training example has to be less than 1 minus epsilon. But we know it's consistent with that one training example. In fact, it's consistent with every training example. So the probability that this function is consistent with m training examples is 1 minus epsilon power m. Roughly the same argument that we had before. There are, how many hypotheses are there? Assume that the set of functions that we have is finite. So, if you have, if the number of functions is size of h, capital H, the probability that there is some hypothesis, I don't know which one, but the probability there is some hypothesis that is bad is, that is consistent with m examples and yet is a bad one is less than the size of the hypothesis times 1 minus epsilon power n. And the way to get from here to here is again union bound. So basically we keep applying the union bound to 
get to these kind of uh, proofs. You look uncomfortable. Yeah, I don't see the union balance step on that. From here to here? Yeah. So, the first step is, I mean, the middle yeah, line. I guess you're saying that the error for the entire set is less than or equal to that. So then the error of one of them is less than or equal to that? Is that what we're saying? That? No, so the error of a single so hypothesis, I don't know which one, is less than 1 minus epsilon power. Right? The probability that there exists, let's say you have two functions. H1 and H2. The probability that one of them is bad has to be less than twice that quantity. Because you have two options. The probability that... <coughs> but your hypothesis space consists of size of H. The probability that all of them... There is one of them is bad. So we are asking basically about the probability of a disjunction. The probability that one of... There exists one event in a set that uh, one of the events in a set happens is the sum of the probability is less than the sum of the probabilities of each of those things happen. We'll pick it up uh, in the next class and we can talk about this offline because I want to stop two minutes early because we have your exams to give out. Um, we'll be posting your uh, the solutions on Canvas if not if it's already if it's not posted already. It's online so you can see the solutions. You can if you have questions you can either come to me or one of the TAs. And we